do have to thank the friends of the Lunenburg Public Library today. They've made this possible, so thank them. And uh, I'll support them. And without much more further ado, please welcome Kate Chadbourne. Well, Falche, can you say that? Falche. Welcome. You know that one. Falche, Stach, welcome. Welcome. I, there's no place I'd rather be. <laughs> I have news for you. The stag bells. The winter pours upon us. The summer is gone. The wind is high and cold. The sun is low and short its course. The sea is wild. The tips of the bracken are red. Its shape is hidden by snow. Often we hear the cry of the barnacle goose. Cold has seized the wings of birds. This is the season of ice. These are my tidings for you. That poem is from the 10th century in Ireland. A thousand years old. Just like me. No. <laughs> Not a bit. But can you say for me, so the word is the same word we have today. The most, one of the most important words in Irish, scale. 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 That means a story or news. So when you go into somebody's house, you often say, and scale. Well, we'll scale again. Do you have a story? Do you have some news? So this is also the, the time of storytelling. It started on the 1st of November, and it goes until the 1st of May. There's a proverb that says, Shkeel Ohawan go a story. Can you say that? Shkeel Ohawan? Shkeel Ohawan. You're naturals, you guys. It's like you've been speaking Irish your whole life. So a story from the 1st of November to the 1st of May. And they say that a shkeli, try that. Shkeli. Storyteller. Shkeel. Shkeli. You get it. A shkeli, a very good shkeli, can tell a story every night in that time, those six months. And the best of the shkeli, the storytellers, can tell one story that lasts that whole time. And now I'm taking you captive and we're going to be here for six months. No. <laughs> it's also the time of fairies. This is the time where our young ones, yourself here in the front row, should be on the alert because fairies are out and about in the world. So let's sing one of my favorite fairy songs. It's called the Fairy Love Song, Your Part. Why should I sit and sigh? Why should I sit and sigh? Brew and bracken, brew and bracken, brew and bracken, brew and bracken. Why should I sit and sigh all alone and weary? Why should I sit and sigh all alone and weary? And brew and bracken is just get in a kerfuffle, right? <laughs> get yourself in a twist. <laughs> Rock. 
softly before me through the willows, peering a smile as sweet as hawthorn blooming. My love has come to cheer me. Now let's do it really quietly. Why should I? In Irish, well, if you're if you're just in Ireland and you're speaking English, do you know what they're called? Them. <laughs> just them. But here's what they're called in Irish is Nabini Maya. You say that? Nabini Maya. The good folk. Now, does that mean they're good? No. Not necessarily. You're right. You're right. So, Fado, Fado, and Eir, and Vi Kritikana, and Urwain. Once, long ago in Ireland, there was a wee hunchy back man. Now, I have to tell you, the word Kritikan is related to the word crit, which is a harp. So, if you're a Kritikan, you have a harp side kind of back, right? The Kritikan an Urwain agus an Tanam na los mor. Once, long ago in Ireland, there was a wee hunchy back man, and the name he had was Les Moore. You say that? Les Moore. Les Moore. Now, Les Moore means the great herb, and that means digitalis, which none of you, you guys know as? Well done. 50 points, Gryffindor. Well done. So, Les Moore was a tailor, and every day he crossed the bridge of Knock Grafton to sell what he had made, and every night he came back, and he went back to his own little house. Well, one night after doing the business in the town, he came back over the bridge of Knock Grafton and he heard singing. And this is what it sounded like. J Lewin J March, J Lewin J March, J Lewin J March, J Lewin J March. Give that a try with me. Ready? J Lewin J March, J Lewin J March, J Lewin J March, J Lewin J March. Now, what is that? It sounds so pretty, doesn't it? And you know what it means? Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday. <laughs> Irish is beautiful. You can really get away with anything. <laughs> he thought it was the most unkill wispinia, the, the sweetest music he'd ever heard in all of his life. And so he stood on the bridge listening for half an hour, maybe, as the fairies under the bridge were singing. Sing it with me again. J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March. Now, you can imagine that at a certain point, he thought to himself, because he was a modest man, I think if I were very careful, I could add something to that song and maybe just make it a little bit better. So this is what he did. J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Kiddin. Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday. You got it. <laughs> and so, just then, the she Giha, the fairy wind, came and swept him off of the bridge and brought him down Queen Drachet under the bridge Agus Kaviamach River. Who was there in front of him? Ah, Nadini Maya. And who's Nadini Maya? You got it, the fairies. And they were smiling at him. And this is what they said. Less more, less more. Doubt not, nor deplore. For the hump which you bore on your back is no more. Look down on the floor and view it less more. And sure enough, he looked down on the floor and what did he see? But it was like a big kind of, like a jello shaped kind of bowl there in the moonlight. And for the first time in his whole life, he stood up straight. And did he feel like a million dollars, right? You know he did. It's like he had chiropractic. He was just, wow. He didn't know the fairies handle that too. And he spent the whole night there, the most fun night he had, singing with them. Sing with me, fairies. J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Candy. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, it was the most best night of his life. They put a new suit of clothes on him and they set him very gently up on the bridge of Knott Grafton the next morning. And he walked home through the countryside and everybody was, is that, is that Lus Moore? That handsome, tall, straight man, is that, is, is that Lus Moore? And you know, 
word gets around, right? As it does here in Lunenburg, a little bit. <laughs> and people hear things, and they talk. Well, it wasn't long before the story, scale, scale, the story reached the ears of another wee Kritikan. But as kind and gentle as Lusmore was, this man was a very different creature. His name was Jack Madden. Jack Madden. And when he heard what happened to Lusmore, this is what he said. If that stupid Lusmore can get that stupid hump off his stupid back from them stupid fairies under that stupid bridge, I can get two suits of stupid clothes from them stupid fairies. I just sing a stupid song. That's the way he was. He was one of those people. You've met them, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, he went to the bridge, you know, the way some people... And he heard that beautiful singing. Sing with me. J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Kaleem. It was so beautiful, but you know, there are people who have no heart for music at all. Isn't that sad, right? He didn't feel that music, that fairy music. He just wanted to get her done. So this is what he did. J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Lewin, J. March, J. Kaleem. Geraldine! <laughs> Thursday! Right? <laughs> And so the Shigiha came and swept him up and brought him down Fuindrachet under the bridge, Erahon on his backside. Now you know that word, poke Mahone. You've heard that before, right? Kiss this part of me, right? <laughs> so he let him down there. And Kavia Bach River, who was there in front of him? Ach, Nadini Maya. The fairies were looking at him. And were they smiling? What do you think? No. You're right, they were not smiling. In fact, this is what they said. Jack Madden, Jack Madden, your words came so bad in. This castle you're had in, your life we will sadden. Here's two hops for Jack Madden. And they picked the big squashy thing up, and if he started like this, he ended like this. And they just mocked him all night. In the morning, they chucked him up on the bridge without very gently. No new suit of clothes. In fact, his own suit was split down the back because he had an extra hump in there. And he kind of went home. And I like to say that he was, I would need to do a lot more yoga with Vicky to get this, but he was so far over because of the new hump that his, pen, his nose made it like a pencil mark in the dirt. The whole way home. Well, that's where Mr. William Butler Yates ends the story. And I'm just glad to tell you that's not where the story ends at all because I know Jack's mother. <laughs> and this is what she told me. So Jack walked in and she said to him, Jack, you Egypt, what have you been doing with yourself at all? And he mumbled something. She said, you go to bed and when you get up, you try and do something good for a change. Well, he went for the wee kip, right? And when he got up, she took the fiddle down off of the wall and she handed it and she said, make something lovely. And I don't know if you've heard anybody play the fiddle for the first time, but this is what it sounds like. It's not lovely at all. And she said, I have errands to do in town. You practice. <laughs> so he practiced. And he practiced. And didn't he practice some more? How many people are practicing something right now? Could be yoga. Could be music. Could be the Rubik's Cube. Yes, what are you practicing? Piano. Awesome. Piano. We practice our whole lives, don't we? And what happens when we practice? We get better. Gold stars, my friend. We get better. So the more Jack Madden practiced, the better he got. And finally, after not too long, he was pretty darn good. And after a lot longer, he was really good. And after a lot longer than that, he was the best in Ireland. And the tune that everybody asked him to play sounded like this. That's my story. If there's a lie in it, so be it. <laughs> Well, I want you to sing a lot today. I brought my Irish flute. I know some of you have seen this kind of a flute. What's beautiful about it is that the wood is from Africa and the silver is from Ireland. Isn't that cool? So, uh, I'm not going to tell you, but you're going to sing this one. I did put the words. Does everybody have a sheet? So you can, yeah, um, you know this one. 
So feel free just to jump in at any time today and sing anything, even if it's against what I'm singing, it will be interesting. <laughs> to trespass on their privacy, which I love. Isn't that wonderful? So we, it's kind of like the Loch Ness Monster, who's a very good friend of mine. We don't, <laughs> we don't ask too much, right? We, we just trust. So I made a song about this, and I put, so um, the words are there for you, and I called it Angels of the Buyer. I believe that actually one of the best things about living on planet Earth is animals. They are among our best citizens, I think. They keep us honest, they're kind, and they teach us a lot. So I hope you'll sing this with me. Oh, hark the life we love. You're, you're going to hear me sing that once, and then we'll all sing Angels of the Buyer together, and then we'll all sing again. Sing whatever part you get is the main part. <laughs> You might think of your cat or dog at home while we do this. <laughs>
Have you ever noticed that? And you know, I love the poet G.K. Chesterton said about Irish uh, people, he said, all their wars are merry and all their songs are sad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Christmas is kind of the best thing we really have going, so it's funny. So I th we're going to do sort of three of them uh, in E minor and then one of them in G major. So we kind of emerge. But again, it's your job to sing because it's, I'm going to be just playing for all I'm worth over here. So <coughs> you sing.
You know, some stories they call traveling stories. Shkiel Patashtol. They go all over it, right? Uh, and some stories are just Irish stories. This story is a Shkiel Tashtol, a traveling story, but this is the way it's told in Ireland. Once, long ago, there was a queen, and she stood at the window of her castle looking out at her twelve handsome sons playing in the snow. And one of them as boys do, threw a stone and killed a raven. And as soon as she saw the red blood of the raven and its black feathers on the white snow, a great desire seized her and she thought, what I would give for a daughter who looked like that. Then she felt a prickle of presence in the room. And when she turned, she saw a very small woman with bright black eyes. And the woman said, would you trade your sons for such a daughter? And she said without thinking, I would. Well, nine months later, a little baby girl was born. And nobody was happier than her twelve big brothers. They all ran into the cradle. And as soon as they reached the cradle, there was a great flapping of wings. And everybody looked with amazement to see twelve geese flying wild geese out the window and out over the fields. And away they went. And the poor queen was there in a welter of sorrow for her sons and joy for her daughter. Well, the years went by and the girl grew up, as they do. And in all of that time, she would notice that sometimes her mother grew quite sad when they were having a feast or a celebration. And she would ask her, Mom, why do you always slip away from, from the feasts and celebrations? And her mother would say, I'll tell you someday when you're older. Well, when she was about 15, 16 years old one day, she asked her mother, and her mother told her the reason. And when the young girl heard this, she said, I will go seek my brothers because it is on my account that this transformation has happened to them. And so she packed her goods and off she went. And she walked far. She walked farther than far. She walked so far she forgot even where her home was. And one day, after so many days walking, she came to a great big lake. And when she looked at the lake, there were 12 wild geese floating on the lake. And there was a castle next to the lake. And she went into the castle and she found that there was a great long table and it was set with 12 places for 12 diners. And she went into the little room and there were 12 beds for 12 sleepers and she waited. And when evening came and the sun set, the 12 wild geese flew in through the window and threw off their bird cloaks and became handsome young men. And they said, who are you? And she said, I'm your sister. I'm your little sister and I've come to help you break the spell that has, been, that has befallen you. Well, the next evening at dusk, they went down into the village because there was a Banfasa. You say that? Banfasa. A wise woman, a woman of wisdom. Myra Nikineji. And they asked her, Myra, what can we ever do to break the spell? And she said, oh, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be the work of years. And your sister must do it herself, by herself, and all of it must be accomplished in perfect silence. She must gather the bog cotton from the wild and hilly places and spin it into thread and sew it into clothes, or sew it into, into, um, <coughs> into cloth, and sew the cloth into a shirt, one for every goose. But if in all of that time she speaks but one word, all of her work will be as nothing. Well, the girl was brave, wasn't she? And the next day she grabbed a great big sack and she went up. Have you seen the bog cotton? It looks like the very end of a cat's tail. It's the <coughs> softest, loveliest thing that grows in all the bogs of Ireland. So lovely. And she went picking the bog cotton everywhere she could. For days and days and days she picked the bog cotton. And when she gathered bags and bags of it, she borrowed a spinning wheel and she began to spin it into thread. And after a little while, she began to make the thread into cloth. And this took years, years and years, without saying a word. 
Well, as I said, word gets around, right? Everywhere word gets around. And it wasn't long until a very handsome prince heard about this strange girl and her strange work up in the moors and mountains. And so he came one day to see her. And as soon as he took a look at her, his heart melted just like a bog pool. <laughs> and even though she couldn't say a single word to him, within an hour they loved each other. And within two hours she had agreed with a nod of her head to marry him. Well, they were delighted and they went back to the castle and they were married. And everybody was thrilled and delighted, except for one person. And that was the prince's stepmother. She took against that girl, didn't she? She just didn't like the looks of her. She's not our kind of people. I don't like her at all. You know the way people are. <coughs> oh, she just looked for a way that she could trip her up. Well, in all that time, the, the young princess now was sewing and weaving and making those shirts again and again, not saying a word. And nine months passed, and her own baby was time to be born. And when she gave birth, she fell asleep and didn't hurt the stepmother creep in and grab the baby, be careful everybody, and throw it out the window. <laughs> Sorry, Ren, there's a baby in the back. Um, we would never do this to you, Ren. Well, <laughs> in the morning when she woke up, her baby was gone, and she was shocked, and everybody came in, and the stepmother came in, and she said, Oh, look at that, she ate her baby. Look, she's a, such a terrible person. She ate her baby, didn't she? And everybody said, well, we don't know that she did that. And she said, if she hadn't, sure she'd tell us, wouldn't she? That's her kind of logic. Well, she had a, a gathering of all the council members, and they decided that the young woman was terrible and was a terrible mother and needed to be punished. And that the very next day, they were going to burn her at the stake. So all night in a fevered trance, she worked on the sh worked on the shirts, worked on the shirts, worked on them all night. Even in the morning, they came and they loaded her into a wagon. She was working and sewing and sewing and sewing the whole time. They brought her to the pyre, and they stood her against the pyre, and she was working the whole time. Never said a word. They built up the turf around her ankles, and some mean person lit it lit it on fire and it began to glow, you know, the way that her fire is, and they heaped it up around her and it was beginning to get very, very hot and she was just finishing the shirts and she couldn't take it any longer and she said, my brothers, where are you? And just then there was a great rush of wings and all around that fire there were these geese, giant geese, and they blew the fire out and as they came she threw a shirt onto each of them, twelve of them except the last one wasn't finished. And when she threw that onto her youngest brother, he had one wing still, but he didn't mind at all. He didn't mind at all, and they brought her down from the pyre, and she told them the whole story, and they all wept and cried and hugged each other, and she said, but my baby, my baby. Well, just at that moment, a wolf came loping out of the woods and turned into a fairy woman and handed her baby to her and she said, I kept your baby safe for you all this time. And so they forgave the foolish queen's rash words. We all say rash things, don't we? I do, many times. And you know, some people say that the bad queen was burned on the pyre. But you know, I don't think so because really, Happy people aren't very interested in what happens to the meanies after they get their white what they want. And so they went home and they brought their baby and the twelve brothers and the prince and all the happy people. And they all lived happily ever after. You got it. Isn't that a humdinger? I just think that story has everything. What about the twelfth brother? Well, the twelfth brother, he, he got a half a shirt, but he had one wing left. <laughs> forever. 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 But he didn't mind. You know, it was pretty cool. That actually worked well with the chick. <laughs>
Sometimes you gotta take halfway, right? <laughs> so at this time in Ireland, just about right now, um, I wrote a dissertation a thousand years ago about folk customs of, of this time of year. And one of the really wonderful ones is called Bourri and Drolin, the Wren Boys. So these are men, now traditionally fully grown men, who would go round and collect straw from all the farmers. And then they would make themselves costumes. And they were costumes that would cover their head and, so, and they would kind of move and shake. They looked like haystacks, if you could imagine a moving haystack. And all the farmers who gave them hay would eventually be invited to a big party, a big huli after, after the event. So they got ready and they, now traditionally they would kill a wren. Now, again, sorry wren, but no, they don't do that anymore. They put a little kind of pretend wren on a, on a we call a beer, like a little platform. And they bring that door to door and they sing this song. The wren, the wren, the king of all birds, St. Stephen's day was caught in the furs. Although he is little, his family is great. Rise up, good lady, and give us a treat. Can you do that with me? Holy, holy, where's your nest? It's in the wood that I like best. It's in the wood, the holly tree, where all the boys will follow me. As I roved out three miles or more, three miles or more, three miles or more, through hedges and ditches and heaps of snow, at six o'clock in the morning. I have a little box under my arm, a tuppence or penny will do you no harm, for we are the boys who came your way to bring in the wren on St. Stephen's Day. <laughs> so you sing that song at the door and the people inside give you a little bit of money. Now why do they give money? And this is what's the most interesting. They give money for luck. Luck. You have to pay for luck. You, right? Nothing is totally free. But here's the beautiful thing is, if you're willing to pay for luck, right, you give the Ren boys a little bit of something, they will invite you to the party as well afterward. So then your luck comes back to you, but the luck they're bringing is a blessing on your house which lasts through the year. So we want that blessing. This is the time to bless your house. Well, we'll have a little, a little break, but I want to sing for you and with you maybe uh, my favorite of the carols. Um, and I didn't put it on there, but you can sing any part of this that you like. Uh, this is Good King Wenceslas. It's my favorite. And the reason is because imagine a leader standing at his window and saying, who's that guy? He looks hungry. Can you imagine? Wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> Let's go out in the snow and feed that guy. I think that's so wonderful. And so through all of the wind and the snow, off they go to feed this guy, right? And even when his young helper becomes a little bit unsettled by the weather, he, you know, in, my, in his footsteps, he trod, right, where the snow lay dinted, and he was in the very sod that the saint had printed. So he's a good guy, and he brings the young one along, and they feed somebody. I love this. I think this is the spirit of the season. So we'll sing this. We'll take a little break, and uh, come back. I have a special guest I want you to meet. Thou knowest it's 
creature that goes around. But the same thing happens. A group of men, although it's a little rowdier, usually the Welsh, they're Methodists, they're always singing angelically, and the Irish get the bad the rap. But in this case, the Welsh are a little bit wilder. They go door to door, and they come to the door, and they sing a thing called the punko, which means a ritualized poem improvised on the spot. You say that, punko. punko. Your first Welsh word, probably. Punko. So they come to the door and they say, through the, through the closed doors, let us in, uh, we'd like to get in there. And the people inside say, why on earth would we let you in, you bunch of drunks? <laughs> and, and so they go back and forth, you know, improvising back and forth. And then, of course, uh, when I did my work on this, uh, the man who played the character you're about to meet said, the old ladies don't like to see us coming, but they know we have to come. So they get inside and they make merry, we'll say. Now, there is a character as part of this, and I've, I've asked my friend Tom, Tom, come here for a minute. <coughs> All right, my friend. You're going to be perfect for this. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. Mary Lewitt, can you say that? Mary Lewitt. Mary Lewitt, which means the grey mare, although it's always a white horse. In Ireland and in <laughs> Wales, the white horse is the supernatural horse. So, somebody would come with the Mary. A man always plays the Mary. Usually, though, I have to tell you, it's not a, a rubber mask. It's an actual horse's head. <laughs> it has been, but no, it's a beloved horse that died naturally. And they, <laughs> no worry. <laughs> and they bury it in lime until it's white and clean and then they deck it with ribbons and then they put a sheet over it and a man goes round 
with the jaws uh, wired so that it can open and shut. And then somebody, and I'm going to be that, called the ostler, is in charge of the horse. And so the, the Mari, the man who played the Mari uh, in Cardiff, told me that his job as the Mari was to be just under control. <laughs> and to try to scare children, although it's harder, he said, it's getting harder and harder to scare children. So they come to the door and they sing this, it's called Kanavadi Luith, the, the, the ballad of the Mari Luith. So I'm going to sing it, and why don't you come up here? Will you come up? Is that all right? I've asked for my assistant. This is a future storyteller right here. And so, yeah, that's your name. This is Owen, a wonderful Irish name, and he's going to be telling stories. You're going to be a shkeli like me. I just know it. So you're going to kind of keep the beat. This is how it goes. And you are just, I'm holding on to him so he doesn't do anything wild. <laughs> Fado, fado. That, that's the way Irish stories start. Now, I'm telling you a Welsh story, but let's work with it. So, fado, fado. Long, long ago, vi caillach a there was a witch, a hag. Say for me, caillach. Caillach is the hag or the witch. And this caillach, her name, I hope you're not saying your mother is that. <laughs> this hag or witch, her name was Keridwen. Say that, Keridwen. And yeah, nice, roll your R's, it's so fun. Keridwen. And Keridwen was a mighty powerful witch. She could do anything. She had the spells and the magic to do anything she wanted. Except there was one thing in her life. She had a son. Ah, oh, she had a son. And he was the most unlikely son you ever saw. He was, I'm sorry to tell you, very, very, very ugly. So ugly that people called him Morvran. Say that? Morvran, which means the great crow. But then sometimes they called him Avagvi. Try that. Avagvi, which means utter darkness. <laughs> so the poor kid. And he was dumb as a hake, as my dad would say. <laughs> Dumb as a hake, the poor kid. He was just, oh, you know, he was just one of those boys. And she worried, because she was a loving mother, wasn't she? She loved her son. Just, you know, he was the kind of boy that only a mother could love. But she wanted to make sure that he would be all right in his time. So she learned of a spell, a very powerful spell. And when she performed this spell, it would imbue the person, the, the target of the spell, with poetic brilliance and inspiration and wisdom. And he would be a brilliant poet and be famous and, and, and do well in the world. But it was a lot of work to make the spell. So every day for 365 days, she had to gather a different herb from the hedge rows and from the hillsides. And she had to bring them home, herb by herb by herb, and put them in a great <coughs> cauldron. Now, the cauldron had to be boiling for a year and a day. And so she hired a nice old fella to keep the fire going. <coughs> and he was this kind of a nice old fella. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that covered one. Yeah, yeah, I'll... I'll. <laughs> <laughs> 
So she hired a boy, <laughs> like you, like you, she hired a boy to watch the old man. Because somebody, you know, it was kind of that way. So the boy, though, was a, was a funny boy. His name was a funny name. It was Gwyn Bach. You say that? Gwyn Bach. Bach, which is an odd little name, and it means Little Mr. Poison. <laughs> but he did his job, and he kept poking the old man, and they would get the fire going again and keep the cauldron boiling. Well, every day, as I told you, she was out gathering the herbs. It was mighty tiring work. And at the end of the year, she just dropped the last herb in the cauldron, and she suddenly became so bone tired, she couldn't even, she couldn't keep herself awake. And she said to them, all right, I have to go to bed. But here's what, put a vagvi right here by the cauldron. Because what's going to happen is three drops of the potion are going to fly up out of the cauldron when it's ready. And they need to touch a, vag a vagvi in order to imbue the poetic inspiration upon it. And so the old man went, yeah, all right, yeah. And Gwen Bach said, right. Well, they put a vagvi there. And almost as soon as her head touched the pillow, didn't the cauldron begin to see them bubble? sort of turned this weird phosphorescent green as it was swirling and swirling. There was a great sense of tension and wildness in the air, and it was growing bubblier and bubblier and boiling and boiling, and three drops came up out of the cauldron, and they were set to come onto a Vagvi's head when <coughs> Gui and Bach stood there, and whoop, the three drops of poetic inspiration went on his mean, poisonous little head. <laughs> And as soon as the poetic inspiration touched him, he knew everything. And what did he know first? She is going to kill me. <laughs> right? And so, lickety split, he turned himself into a hare, a rabbit. And out the door he went. And she woke up from her dream and went. And she turned into a greyhound. Uh -huh. And she went after him, hell for leather, and they coursed over the hills, up and down. Oh, the poor little rabbit hare heart was pounding in his chest, right? Until he thought he would die. And so he leapt into the river, and he turned into a salmon. And she leapt in after him, and she turned into, what do you think? Shark. I love that idea. <laughs> Wales doesn't have a lot of sharks in its rivers, but... Uh, <laughs> We'll call her an otter shark. She turned into an otter shark, a really fierce otter. And she went after him, and oh, they went. And again, that little fish heart was pounding like crazy till he thought he couldn't take one more minute. And he leapt up out of the river, and he turned into... He turned into a wren. He turned into a wren, and she... Turned into a red-tailed hawk. And off they went. Oh, flying. I mean, it was an amazing aeronautical display. And again, that little heart in the wren chest was pounding so hard. Well, he came over a, a, a barn, and inside they were threshing wheat. And he turned himself into whew, one grain of wheat. One grain of wheat out of thousands, millions, maybe? She landed. You can see even on a hawk face. Mad. <laughs> she turned into bark, a black tailed chicken. Bark, 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 bark. And she began to peck the grains of wheat. Bark, 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 and pecked and pecked and pecked until she thought her belly would explode, but she kept back and bark, 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 bark. And she found the grain of wheat that was Guyenbach, and she swallowed him down. Now, this is how you get pregnant in the old story. <laughs> <laughs> how it works. And so, nine months later, there was a baby born. And you know, that whole time she, well, I ought to, you know, she was so mad, still so mad, right? And here was this beautiful, beautiful baby, right? Every baby. The library baby. Beautiful. The, and she wanted so much to do him harm, but as soon as she looked at him, she couldn't do it.
but she was still mad, mind you. So she wrapped him up in this kind of basket, a little coracle, and she put black leather all around it so it was like watertight. This is the second baby chucking incident of our time together. <laughs> and she chucked him in the river, towing, and he floated down the river and into the sea. And he floated in his basket for 700 years. <laughs> he floated on the sea until Halloween night. And he floated up a little tributary of the river. And he got caught, his little <coughs> basket got caught in a salmon weir. And the nobleman came to the salmon weir hoping to get a big catch of salmon that would keep him in wine and women for the rest of the year. <laughs> and instead there was this basket and he didn't know what it was. But he heard a little whimpering sound from inside it. And he took his penknife out and he opened it really carefully. And what did he see as soon as he did but a little tiny beautiful baby's forehead. And he said, Tal Yesen. You say that? Tal Yesen, which means beautiful or shining forehead. And that is how the greatest of the Welsh poets that ever lived from then for eternity was born in Wales. That's the story. <laughs> Scotland and we'll sing with Bobby Burns. We got a lot of poets in this room, a lot of poets here. Put your hand up, you're a poet. Don't be shy. Good, 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 the, the hands up. So, the Bard of Scotland. You know this one. I don't know if it's the version you know, but you'll figure it right out. So, but I, I thought it was important to sing it because, I don't know about you, but you know, you get into the middle of your life and you think about things that happen, don't you? You know, you pull out your Christmas ornaments and you, you remember the people and, oh, you know, like the popsicle stick cross that you made and all, <laughs> all those lovely things that your mother still has to hang up out of loyalty to you, but y you think about the old days. So I think, uh, should old acquaintance be forgot? No. Sometimes they shouldn't be put up with, but sometimes but they shouldn't be put up with. <laughs>
you know, I teach piano lessons, I teach harp lessons and singing lessons, but I have to say, whenever anyone under like, well, maybe all ages, when I say what is the holiday song you want to sing or play, this is the one. So, um, sing it with me. You've got it. Do it, did, maybe I didn't give it to you. Well, this is a fun surprise. <laughs> Let me tell you another story. What's the word for story, everybody? Scale. Scale. Yeah. God, 
This one has a very good memory. He does, yeah. I bet it comes back to haunt you sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you know, how do Irish stories start? Well done. Fado, fado. That's it. Fado, fado. This is a Scottish story, but they also use this. Fado, fado. <laughs> Once long ago, there was a king, and he had a lovely daughter, and guess what her name was? Kate. <laughs> he had a daughter called Kate. Now, I'm sorry to tell you that Kate's mother died, and so the king had no queen for some time. Well, after not too long had gone by, he found another queen to marry, and he married this queen, and as it happens, she also had a daughter, and guess what her name was? Kate. Right, and that would have been very confusing, except that the king's daughter, Kate, was by far the bonnier of the two. She was just a bit prettier. And so people called her Bonnie Kate, and the queen's daughter they just called Kate. But you know what? Here's the thing. Anrodisano is inta. That's a wonderful proverb. The thing that is rarest is most wonderful. The thing that is rarest is most wonderful. The king's daughter Kate and the queen's daughter Kate right away were like sisters. They loved each other. There wasn't a hair of any of that between them. But the queen was still very unsatisfied with how beautiful Bonnie Kate was. And so she thought and thought about what she could do about it, and she decided she'd go down the road to the hen wife, Kailach Nagyark. So you know that word, Kailach, the hag or the witch. And she said to her, what can you do now to take care of Bonnie Kate, because I don't like her being so pretty. And the hen wife said, send her down to me first thing in the morning without a sup to drink or a bite to eat, and I'll soon hash up her pretty face. Whew. Well, in the morning, Kate was sent down the road to get a basket of eggs, but as she went, she went down through the kitchen and she saw some oat cakes on the table and she munched them as she went down. And she came in and she asked for the eggs and Kailach the Gark, the hen's <coughs> wife, said to her, Dearie, see that pot in the corner there? Lift the lid off that pot and see what you will see. So Kate, being obliging, went over and lifted the lid off the pot, and a great cloud of steam came rising up out of the pot, but nothing more. And the hen wife said, you tell the queen to lock her larder door. Well, the next day Kate was sent again to get a basket of eggs, but this time when she came down through the kitchen in the larder, she found all the, all the cabinets. She couldn't get even a Captain Crunch. There was nothing. <laughs> she couldn't get nothing. And so she went along the way. But as she went, she met a man who was picking peas in the dew, the early dew. And he gave her some, some peas to munch. And she went along. And just again, Kailuk the Garg said to her, Lift the lid off that pot, dearie, and see what you will see. And so Kate lifted the lid off the pot. And a great cloud of steam came up out of the pot, and nothing more. Mm -hmm. And this time, Kailuk Nagark said, You tell the queen if she wants something done right, she should do it herself. <laughs> well, the next morning, Kate was roughly shaken awake and frog marched down the road without taking a single sip of water. And once again, Kailuk Nagark pointed at the cauldron in the corner, and she said, Lift the lid off that pot, dairy, and see what you will see. So Kate, she'd done it before, she lifted the lid, and a great cloud of steam came up out of the pot, and you'll know what else came. A sheep's head, and it hovered in the air for a moment, and it came over Kate, and then, and it covered her own bonny head. She had a sheep's head now, not a beautiful girl's head. Well. Wow. Now the queen was satisfied. <laughs> well, they went home, and the, and the queen's daughter was furious. She said, my mother is after a cotton-picking mind. We have got to get you away from here, because who knows what she'll do next. And so she wrapped a linen cloth around her sister's head, and she took her by the hand, and they walked down the road. And they walked far, and they walked farther than far, until they didn't even know where they were anymore. And they came to a castle and they went in. And Kate went right in and she said, I'd like a job here, please. And in exchange for my wages, I'd like my sister to have a place. She's, she's, not, she's ill, and I'd like my sister to have a place to stay. And they said, all right, you can work in the scullery. And so she began to wash dishes and do all that kitchen work. 
Well, it so happens that in that castle there were two sons. The king and the queen had two sons. And the elder of the two sons was very ill. And no one could understand it. In fact, anybody who was set to watch him at night would disappear and never be seen again. So when Kate found out about this, she went to the king and said, For a bag of silver, I'll sit with the prince, I'll watch him. And the king said, All right. And so she sat down in the evening and she watched him and he just slept and slept until the stroke of midnight. And as soon as the stroke of midnight, he sat up in bed, pulled on his boots, walked down, right down to the stables, saddled his horse, jumped up, and she jumped up behind him. And he whistled for his hound, and away they went through the snow. Just the horse going through the snow. Well, they came to a hazelnut grove, and as they, as they way, made their way through the trees, she was picking the hazelnuts and putting them in her pockets, picking, picking, picking. Well, they came to a great big green hill. She thought, we're about to crash into the hill. But he said, hill, hill, open up and let in the prince. And she said, and his fair lady behind him. And sure enough, a door opened in the hillside. And they went right in on the horse. And as soon as they came inside, they heard the most wonderful music and kill Espinia, the sweetest music. Now, who makes the sweetest music? That's right. And she knew right away, she slipped down off the horse and she went to hide herself behind the door. And as soon as the prince came in the door, didn't twelve beautiful girls just surround him and sweep him off to dance all night? Well, she stayed in the shadows because she knew if the fairy saw her, she would not be going home. And she watched and watched until she saw there was a little fairy child about your age who was playing with a piece of silver, was rolling it and rolling it. And a fairy mother, just like you, came out and said, now you be careful with that magic wand, because just three taps of that wand, and that bonny girl with her sheep's head would be beautiful all over again. Well, Kate took some hazelnuts out of her pocket and she rolled them and rolled them and rolled them until the fairy child could not restrain herself and went to catch those hazelnuts and left the magic wand and Kate hid it in her cloak. Well, in the morning when the rooster crowed, the prince got back on his horse and she leapt up behind him and away they went back to the castle. And in the morning, the king came in and he saw there was the prince sleeping in his bed. And there was this girl, Kate. No one had ever done that. She was just sitting there cracking hazelnuts. And they said, how did he do? What, what happened? And she said, he passed a fine night. That's all she said, which was true, technically. Well, they said, would you ever consent to watch him again? And she said, I, I will, for a bag of gold. And he said, all right, you'll have that. So as soon as she left, as soon as they left, she ran up the stairs to the turret where her sister was sleeping, and she took the magic wand and gave her three taps. And that sheep's head, whoop, it was kind of a graphic sound, but it came right off. <laughs> and, and she was beautiful again. They did a little bit of wash, and she was great. <laughs> so that evening, she sat down next to the prince again, and this very same thing happened at the stroke of midnight. Up, you know, pull on the boots, up on the horse, and she jumped up behind him, whistled for the dog, and away they went. Back through the hazel grove, and she was picking the hazelnuts, picking, picking, picking. And when they arrived at the hill, he said, Open, open green hill, and let in the prince with his horse and hound. And she said, And his fair lady behind him. And the door opened, and they heard, And Kyola's Binya, that lovely music coming out again. Once again, she swept into the shadows, and these beautiful fairy princesses all came around the prince and swept him off to dance. Well, again, there was a nice little fairy child, just like you. And this time, she had a beautiful white bird with a silver beak. And she was throwing it up and catching it, and throwing it up and catching it. And her fairy mother said, you be careful with that fairy bird, because just three bites of its flesh, and the prince would be free from our fairy enchantments. Well, Kate took a hazelnut out of her pocket and rolled it. 
and she rolled another, and she rolled another until the little girl couldn't help herself, but she skittered off to catch them, leaving the bird, which Kate caught and put right into her cloak. And in the morning, when the rooster called, up they went on the horse and back to the castle. Well, before anyone came in, what had she done? And here's my apology to the vegans among us. <laughs> she killed the bird and she plucked its feathers. And then she set it to roast over the fire. And oh gosh, the smell of it. Oh, the smell of it. The prince stirred in his sleep and he said, Oh, if I could have just one bite of that bird. She gave him a bite of the roasted succulent flesh. He said, Oh, he stirred a little. If I could have just one more bite of that bird. She gave him another. Now he sat up on the side of the bed and he said, If I could just have one more bite of that bird, I would be restored. I would flourish again. And she gave him the bite. And the roses came back in his cheeks and he looked wonderful. And when his mother and father, the king and queen, came in, didn't they find the two of them sitting there in front of the open fire, roasting hazelnuts and cracking them like old friends? Oh, it was wonderful. And the king said, you have done more than anyone could ever do. And of course you'll have your silver and gold. But can we give you something else? And she said, well, there is something. And I bet you're reading my mind right now. <laughs> she said, well, I, I, I would like to marry the prince. And they said, prince, would you like to marry Kate? And he said, well, of course I would. <laughs> and so the two were set to be married. And guess who else met? The Bonnie Kate up in the, up in the uh, upper tower and the other prince. And they fell in love. And so all of them were set to be married. Now, this would have been very confusing again. They called one Kate, Kate. And they called this brave Kate, Kate Cracker Nuts. <laughs> and so they got married and they had a wonderful wedding. I was there telling stories for them. And it was marvelous. And they all lived happily ever after. The dogs and the horses, the fairies under the hill, the princes and all the Kates. And so, my friends, shall we. <laughs> My least ladylike instrument, uh, it's called the melodeon, uh, and I'm going to play a little, you're going to sing, I hope. Um, why is it not very ladylike? Because a lot of spit is involved, but <laughs> I enjoy it. So I'm going, we're going to, uh, you're going to sing, I hope, away in a manger. I can't actually sing through my nose as I play this. So you have to carry us again. And then afterward, I'm going to play a little jig I made up called the moon jig.
the wig. It's Where's not the a bagpipe. It sounds like a bagpipe. It's called a melodeon. Ah. It's called a melodeon. Um, it sounds to me like Parisian cafe. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, even Italian. You could, but, but I think it works for, for Irish. So I made a song, actually, last week, uh, which at least one person had the chance to sing. Uh, I, I really mean it when I say I think Falcha is probably the most, even though I, you know I love scale a lot, and I'm rather fond of slancha myself, but uh, I think Falcha is my number one word, um, welcome. I think Falcha is the most important of the Irish words, and anyone who's been to Ireland, and many of you told me how, know that sense of Falcha, of being welcomed in. So I want to teach you a little, um, little bit. So here's your part. You, I wrote it on that little sheet. Your part is falcha ishtach. Did you say that? Falcha ishtach. So falcha ishtach means welcome in. And that's what you say. Falcha ishtach. And then the second, and I tried to write it in kind of funny phonetic. Falcha ishtach. So you can see it. Falcha, try it again. Falcha ishtach. Falcha ishtach. Now, tar ishtach. Say that. Tar ishtach. Come in, agus falcha. Agus falcha. So tarish tach agus falcha. Welcome in, welcome in, come in and welcome. So we'll sing this together. I wanted you to have an opportunity to go to Ireland um, without even paying Aer Lingus. I thought. <laughs> They would open the door and they'd say this. A Wildanian shop. You say that? A Wildanian shop. Are there people here? And you're going to hear the sound inside. And people call out, Ta, ta kincha, ta dinian shop. Ta rishtach, a gisfalcha. Yes, of course, there are people. Come in and welcome. Sing it with me. which means a drink comes before a story. <laughs> now it might be a cup of tea, but we're going to be spending some time telling stories. Join me. So you're spending the happiest night of your life telling stories and listening to stories. And now, what do you say if you like a story in Irish? You say, Fania or Ort. You try that. Fania or Ort. And that means a gold ring on you. Isn't that beautiful? Or you can say, Ardar. Try that. Ardar. That means great man or Ardvan. Ardvan, great woman. Tell your story, tell your story now. Praise the story, praise the tellers all. Here we go. It's one of the happiest nights you remember. And it's time to go. And so you need to give your thanks to the banati. Say that. Sanity. 
That's the woman of the house and the Farati. Say that. Farati. Farati, the man of the house. Farati, Farati, my love. Farati, Farati, my go out into that cold night to go home for the few hours of sleep that's left, you know what you're going to say when you meet people at your door? What are you going to say? Go away. <laughs> no, no. You might. You might. But what else might you say? I am Ready? Sing it with me, everybody, one more time. want that? And don't we want to love each other and have a great year? Yeah. Yes, of course we do. So here's, here's for our own fellow. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat, of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Bravo! one more old song together, but I just want to thank you all so much. Uh, you're wonderful. You know, Kujikta is a great, I'll teach you one more word, Kujikta. Kujikta, and it means company, right? Kujikta way, Kujikta way, great company. That's what you are, great company, every single one of you. Thank you. I want to say a special thanks to Moore and to the library. Thank you. Library, and also I think we should say a special thank you to Ren, who is an angel. Bravo. Bravo. And thank you everybody. Please do take a Ren card. Um, I have a mailing list. I, I send charming and infrequent letters. Uh, I'd like to be in touch, and if you want to be in touch, I've also got my latest product, which is a tiny bumper sticker. They're just a dollar. It's my motto, and it's show up and be nice. So if you know somebody who could use a little advice, it's very unobtrusive, right? You just slip it under their door and they won't even know you sent it. <laughs> so, all right. We're going to sing one more song together. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about it, just to say that it draws on very ancient Celtic themes of the woodland and of belonging, and, um, and I, you'll know it in, right away. You'll know it. Thank you. 